fair warning to everybody. I just rewatched this back after I, if you can call it editing, edited it, and it looks touty as fuck. But I spent a little bit of time on it, so I'm going to post it anyhow. If I can't figure out how to make it not sound touty, won't be. But fucking deal with it. Fucking dog. Fucking dog's pissed anyhow. There's a lot of guesswork when it comes to picking players for your DraftKings team or teams if you're a coward this week, and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. How can you pick between the best of the best? How can you say with conviction that John Rahm is a much better play than, say, Dustin Johnson? For the record, I think it's Rahm, but that's just because that's what I'm guessing. So what do you do? Take whoever you want amongst the highest priced players here and try to be better than everyone else when it comes to picking the cheaper guys. DJ versus Rom is a toss-up, but 8,400 Cam Smith versus 8,300 Joaquin Nguyen, that you can try and figure out. Knowing the 10 and 11K guys are great players doesn't take a lot of brain power, but figuring out which 6K and 7K guys to fill in with them, that's something you can try to figure out as well. Out of the guys at the top here, John Rom and Justin Thomas do appeal to me the most. Thomas has won here twice and always shows up at these no-cut events with a better track record than anyone in these settings. Rom is about to have a monster year and this place is the perfect start for him. Some are worried about his club switch, but just because he only announced it last week doesn't mean he hasn't been practicing with his new clubs for more than a month. It's a new set of clubs. It's not like he's being forced to play left-handed or anything crazy. I have zero concerns about the club change. Patrick Cantlay at 9,800 is the only other player above 9,000 that I would really like to try and get up to if possible. It's just a matter if I can make things work on the cheap end which isn't that likely because after my must play of Cameron Champ at 7,900, the only four players I feel moderately comfortable taking are Mark Leishman, Sebastian Munoz, Jason Kolkrak, and Lanto Griffin, and none of them inspire a ton of confidence in me. No one under 6,900 is even under consideration. If I take Champ plus the three cheapest of that group, which I'm not at all comfortable doing, that gives me room to take two 10K guys, or DJ and a 9K guy. That means three guys I don't overly like in a tournament that only has 42 players. No thanks. At most, I want one guy from that group of four, preferably Munoz if I have to take one. I discussed my reasoning for Cam Champ at length on my most recent podcast. So if you want to know why I'm playing him, check out Strokes Gain Golf Shots wherever you get your podcasts. If I don't want anyone cheap, I can't really take any of the expensive players I have interest in. But after looking at the players 9,000 and under, I am okay with that. Here are the players that piqued my interest. Colin Morikawa, too cheap at 8,800, priced under guys that I think he outclasses like Vic Hovland and Tony Finau. Even the players right below him like Harris English and Scotty Scheffler can't sniff his combination of talent and winning upside. Morikawa has played well here before and is a top five iron player in the world. Priced slightly above Morikawa is Hideki Matsuyama. Hideki has incredible course history with finishes of second, third, and fourth here. His form to end the year was exceptional, and he's clearly okay playing here off a layoff. I'd be surprised to see him outside the top 10. Tony Finau can send the ball out further than almost anyone on tour, and that will be a huge value here. He is rarely out of contention and gets a ton of birdies. 8,800 for him is a great option. Daniel Berger is a guy that really has no weaknesses. He has vastly improved over the past year, which makes sense because he spent a couple years trying to recover from a wrist injury. He has clearly shown that he, in, that he belongs in the upper class of golfers and has no problem competing with these big names. Sanjay M doesn't seem to fit the course as well as some others, but his birdie making ability combined with his $8,200 price make him a good option for me. Out of all the guys I'm listing in this range, he's probably my least favorite, but he has a good floor for DraftKings points with his birdie scoring. Adam Scott is 8,100, and I really think the only reason is his lack of starts last summer, with only six appearances after the restart. He has proven time and again he has no issue playing well after a layoff, so I think Scott's overall talent trumps his lack of recent play and makes him a good option with cheaper than usual price. Abe Answer is the last guy I'll look at here. As I've mentioned many times, Answer does nothing poorly and is starting to really take a big step forward in his career. If he really is turning into the golfer I think he is, 8,000 is way too cheap of a price for him. He is so consistent that even at his worst, he probably comes close to being worth the price. My only issue is that one of his biggest strengths 
accuracy off the T is kind of mitigated here. So the decisions for the week are simpler than most. Decision number one, am I confident with multiple cheap players? Definitely not. Are the expensive players worth it if it forces me into playing two or three of those guys? No, not with so many great golfers in the mid range. So with that part figured out, all I have to do is narrow it down to six golfers that fit under the 50K salary cap. Easy peasy, champ is locked. If I follow him with answer and play him, Scott and him, I don't even need to dip down to Minos. If I wanna play three of Morikawa, Matsuyama, Berger and Finau, then I do. But the only guy I'm, super, not, I'm not super confident of in that scenario is Munoz, which isn't that bad. So I have a couple decisions to make before Thursday morning, and I'm sure I'll change my mind 17 times before now and then. Go champ.